Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, am not sure that my voice will hold out for another hour and a half, so we may have to have uh, an hour and a quarter for question and answer uh, this session, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do my best. And, uh, the topic uh, for this uh, session is uh, ideology. I mentioned uh, in this morning's talk that uh, many scholars uh, of the growth of government have uh, to some extent uh, dealt with the role of ideology in, uh, in the growth of government. Uh, it's, uh, it's clear that uh, every government has a kind of uh, intellectual bodyguard uh, as I believe the, uh, the German uh, professors of the late 19th century were, were said to be for the, for the uh, royal family of the German Empire at the time. And uh, regardless of uh, the status of government, whether it's monarchy or empire or democracy, uh, all governments realize that they, uh, they need some intellectual cover for what they do. Uh, and <clears throat> there are always some people who are willing to, to serve as uh, intellectual bodyguards. Uh, some, I, I suppose, actually believe in what they're doing. They're not uh, coerced or they're not even getting paid uh, to propound arguments that justify the actions of government and the growth of government. So I, I, I don't take a, a completely cynical view of, of uh, the people who argue along those lines. Uh, some of them believe in what they say. Others obviously are prostitutes and uh, hope to uh, gain either income or social standing uh, or in some cases... Uh, simply to enjoy proximity to the seats of power. Uh, I, I like to think of people such as uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. as the uh, archetype of the uh, court historian, the, uh, the intellectual who not only is willing to serve in an administration, uh, but who's willing to spend a good deal of his uh, of his time and, and energy thereafter uh, writing laudatory accounts of what was done uh, by uh, presidents or other uh, officers of the government. So uh, every government uh, needs legitimacy. As, uh, I mentioned this morning uh, Observers as uh, far back as uh, 1550, uh, when we have the uh, the arguments of Etienne de la uh, la Boutui, uh, have recognized, uh, as Machiavelli himself did, that uh, one one needs to to uh, tell a good tale and. Uh, Nowadays, there's a more than cottage industry. There's a major industry uh, devoted to uh, propagating uh, ideas that will assist the government in establishing its legitimacy and, and providing uh, rationales uh, for expansions of its powers. Now, it's, uh, it's no shocking statement to say that, that ideas have some importance in social action. Uh, Mises himself uh, once wrote that, that uh, people do not act to promote their interests, as many social scientists uh, claim. Uh, people act to promote what they believe their interests are. And there's a considerable difference, and not only because they may be m mistaken <laughs> about uh, how uh, certain uh, events or actions or programs will uh, affect them and their well-being, uh, 
but because, in fact, everything that human beings do is based on belief, uh, on ideas. It's, uh, it's ideas that move us to engage in human action. It's the thought we have that we can imagine an alternative state of affairs that we would prefer to the existing state of affairs. And from that idea, we're moved to take some action to realize that imagined superior state of affairs. So uh, very often we find in social science a, a kind of assumption about the immediacy of interest, particularly in public choice uh, and political science. Uh, uh, the analysts often suppose that, uh, say, in the United States, uh, a black person uh, must favor government redistributive schemes because well, uh, black people would stand to gain from uh, taxing uh, high-income persons and redistributing the income to relatively low-income persons, blacks being predominantly in the relatively low-income group. So ipso facto, uh, it promotes their interest. Uh, sometimes those kinds of assumptions uh, are arguably fairly sound, uh, but often they're not sound. We just assume that because we know something about where people stand in society or something about their age or sex or uh, location, that from that we know what is in their interests. But people always have to conceive of how something is in their interest. And uh, it's from those conceptions that, that they're moved to ever do anything. Now, to say that ideas matter uh, is, is an elementary kind of proposition, uh, but when we talk about ideology, we're talking about something uh, somewhat more complicated than just ideas, because uh, an ideology is not uh, simply uh, any old body of beliefs. It's a particular kind of belief system, and uh, Scholars have devoted a lot of attention to the study of ideology. Much of this literature, uh, I'm sorry to say, is, uh, is not worth your time. Uh, and it probably wasn't worth mine uh, when I read it myself, or a good deal of it uh, myself. But... But some of, it is, uh, some of it is worthwhile, and uh, it's, uh, it's good to know that people have been thinking about ideology and its, and its place in society for at least uh, the past two centuries. Uh, conceptions of ideology vary quite a lot among scholars, and that uh, complicates uh, one's reading and absorbing of any uh, real understanding from what has been written. Uh, and uh, there are different conceptions of what, what is meant by ideology and, and where it comes from and what consequences it has. Uh, but uh, at least there's a fairly general understanding that, that it, it's not trivial, that it is a significant aspect of the operation of society. And if we want to understand how uh, society operates, we need to understand the role of ideology. Now, economists uh, lavished a lot of attention in the past 40 years uh, to the question of collective action. And I want to talk about that for a few minutes because uh, collective action clearly has been an important mechanism for bringing about the growth of government. And uh, the issue that was raised early on, particularly by Mansur Olson, who, who has had a huge following uh, among social scientists in this country, uh, had to do with uh, the rationality of uh, collective action. Uh, Olson raised the question whether it made sense for people to even engage in this kind of action. Uh, and uh, suggested that, at least in many uh, cases, it didn't make sense. So uh, he, he created a kind of puzzle, a conundrum. Uh, why are people doing these things? 
uh, particularly when they're the kinds of things that have serious consequences. And, and uh, one of them is promoting the growth of, of bigger government. So let, let's start by saying, what, what do social scientists mean by a collective good? I touched on this uh, matter this morning uh, under the heading of public good. Uh, they're the same uh, idea, just two different names uh, used by social scientists, a, a collective good or a public good is one that has the attribute of, of non-rivalry and consumption. So that if it's created at all, for at least for a domain of beneficiaries, uh, then it's, it's created for everybody in that domain. Uh, if, uh, if, for example, we show a, a film in a theater, uh, then once it's being shown, uh, anyone in that theater can benefit from it, whether there's one person watching or whether we add a second person or we continue to add people. Uh, there's no additional cost to showing the film, and uh, so we have a zero marginal cost of uh, use, at least up to the point where, in this example, we filled up the theater. Now, that's why I said collective goods are always relative to a domain of users. We might conceive of a collective good that, that has a huge domain. Uh, this morning I suggested that deterrence of atomic attack against the United States might conceivably be a good that benefited all the people in this huge nation state, uh, which is a very different order of magnitude than filling up a theater. So uh, when we talk about the, this kind of good, we always have to have in mind what the do domain is or is claimed to be, at least. But uh, within the domain, the collective good uh, has no marginal cost of additional uh, use. And uh, furthermore, it's often stipulated that, that no one can be excluded from uh, enjoying the use of the good once it's created at all. So that if, uh, if for example, uh, deterrence from atomic attack is provided for the United States, then, then there, there, there's no way to, to say, uh, well, Brad, uh, you don't want this, so we'll, we'll let you opt out here. You can't, cannot opt out. We can't exclude him, uh, even if, for example, he says, I won't help to pay. Uh, I don't want it. Uh, I'm not interested. Uh, we, he's still going to get this benefit uh, nonetheless. So non-rivalry and consumption and non-exclusivity uh, are the defining characteristics of a collective good. Now very often when we talk about policies, we're talking about uh, uh, actions uh, that, that bring into being uh, some, some state of affairs that has at least uh, approximately the character of a collective good. If, for example, we talk about an agricultural program uh, that the government might undertake to restrict the supply of wheat, uh, the objective being to, to cause the market price of wheat to, to be higher than it otherwise would have been. Well, uh, the increase in the price of the product uh, is something that will benefit every seller of wheat. So every farmer, or every middleman, or whoever has wheat to sell is going to be a better position if this policy is adopted. Uh, so the, the collective good aspect of policy uh, applies to many different proposals uh, that are uh, made for, for what government ought to be doing uh, to, to help some subset of people, or in some cases to ostensibly help everybody. Uh, now, what Mansur Olson said is that if we have a large group of potential beneficiaries uh, of a collective good, then... Uh, it won't make any sense for anybody to help to pay to bring that policy into effect because uh, 
The costs that would be borne are positive. Uh, some sacrifice must be incurred. Uh, and yet, uh, if it's a large group situation, my contribution, whether I make it or not, is not going to be decisive for whether the policy is actually created and put into effect. So I can treat the policy's realization the way I deal with the weather. I don't know if it's going to rain, not rain. It's just something that happens or doesn't. It's pointless for me to take some action to try to affect whether it's going to rain this afternoon. It'll be what it'll be. Okay? So Olson said in a large group situation, uh, uh, potential beneficiaries view policy implementation as a state of nature. If it happens, good. If it's something that happens and creates a benefit for them, wonderful. But uh, if, if it doesn't happen, well, too bad. At least I didn't throw away my money trying to bring it about. Okay? So he said it's irrational for people to bear any cost whatsoever in a large group situation to bring about the realization of a policy that creates collective good type benefits. But if nobody's willing to incur any cost, nobody does anything, and you never do the politics and the lobbying and the paying off legislatures and whatever else is required uh, to bring this program into being for anybody. So the conclusion is that, that nothing happens. That people never engage in collective action in these large group settings. Now Olson said, if it's a small group situation, if, for example, uh, the automobile sellers in the United States uh, would like to have a program that puts a quota on the importation of automobiles from other countries. Well, there are only three or four big car companies, and uh, it'll pay them, any one of them, actually, to bear a lot of costs in order to get this quota put into effect. Uh, so the, the problem is different in the small group setting. And furthermore, you, you can't cheat easily. Uh, you know, if we had a whole bunch of uh, farmers, in fact, uh, this was tried many times in the 19th century. The, the Southerners down here used to have a convention of cotton growers almost every year. And they would get a bunch of uh, plantation owners and farmers together and they'd say, this situation is terrible. Cotton is selling for six cents a pound. We're all going broke. We all understand that if we just cut back, let's say we only put half as much cotton on the market next year, we're going to cut the American supply down and it's going to drive that price up because even, even at that time they kind of understood that the demand was, was inelastic. And so they knew if they managed to restrict the quantity supplied uh, on the American market substantially, they'd get a more than uh, proportionate increase in the market price. So they said, all we got to do is agree. So they, they would agree. They'd all pat one another on the back and have another couple of bourbons and they would agree that they were going to plant only half as much cotton next year so that they could improve their dire situation. And every year without fail, <laughs> they'd all go back and plant even more than they had the previous year because they're not expecting that somebody might cut back and raise the price. They'd make more money by having more cotton to sell. <laughs> So, of course, these schemes to, uh, to cartelize this massive industry with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of suppliers was hopeless because people cheated on these agreements. There was no way to monitor them adequately or to compel them to, to pay some penalty in the event that they didn't comply with their promise. And, and that's a general problem whenever you have large groups of people agreeing to take some action that, that can't be enforced or, or, or monitored. But in a small group situation, it's pretty easy to see if, 
if, if the car manufacturers are taking a particular action or not. Uh, any, any one just watches two others, and that's a, that's a fairly easy <coughs> endeavor. So uh, small groups can manage things that big, big groups can't. Uh, and Olson said that also sometimes you can get things done by using what he calls selective incentives. Uh, the best one, of course, was, was coercion. <laughs> and uh, that often required that you, you get government involved straight away uh, to make sure that whatever it was that the, uh, the interest group was lobbying for, uh, they could uh, get government assistance behind the enforcement of their efforts. And uh, this was uh, something, for example, that eventually the farmers did uh, manage to do pretty successfully af after 1933 uh, to get the force of law behind some of their supply restriction schemes, and, and that made them work uh, the way they were supposed to work uh, to the great to detriment of the public, uh, but for the benefit of the farmers involved in them. So, so we do have these ways to get around uh, these uh, free rider problems, they came to be called. That, uh, nobody wants to bear the cost when he can get the benefit without bearing cost. And uh, the, the, the problem is that uh, in, in the large group case, these, these techniques of using coercion or or, or taking advantage of small group uh, monitoring are not available. So what do, what do we do about those cases in which we have a collective action involving lots of potential uh, beneficiaries uh, in which people uh, with complete disregard for neoclassical economics insist on going ahead and engaging in collective action? Uh, if, if, for example, you've got uh, a lot of people, as you, as you do particularly in, in Europe, uh, who, who oppose a nuclear power, uh, not just nuclear weapons, the nuclear power generation they oppose. Any, anything nuclear, the anti-nukes are, are against. Uh, and, and these people are a pretty big uh, interest group in, in Germany and some of the other European countries. So, so what, what do they do? They, they hold massive demonstrations. Uh, they organize uh, meetings. They support candidates for public office. They do all kinds of things. And if you look at any given person uh, in, involved in this activity, it looks like a perfect refutation of Mansur Olson's argument. Like, so, I, so I'm Gunner here uh, in, in Bremen, and uh, I can go to this street demonstration against nuclear power or not. If I go, I have to use my time at least uh, and if they want me to make a contribution to the, to the protest group or to help pay for leaflets or, or television programs or something else, I have to sacrifice whatever I could have purchased with that uh, contribution money. So there are, there are costs of involving myself, uh, but do I really believe that whether I participate or not is going to determine the success of the anti-nuke movement? Absurd to imagine anybody thinking that. Uh, uh, curiously, actually, Carl Dieter Opp, uh, who uh, is a, a very uh, interesting uh, sociologist uh, in Germany, uh, <laughs> did a number of studies of the anti-nukes. And he, and he found, among other things, that some of them actually claim that they will make a difference. <laughs> If you ask them, do you think it'll make a difference in the success of your movement, whether you personally participate or not? And they say, yes. <laughs> now, that's hard to uh, swallow. Uh, but people believe odd things, and, uh, and perhaps some of them actually believe that. But, but uh, Op actually has some much better explanations of their participation uh, along the lines I'll come to in a minute. Well, suppose there were a way that people could get benefits from participating in seeking large group collective action. And furthermore, that uh, if they don't participate 
they'll lose those benefits. You see, the way uh, analysts have normally construed the benefit of participating in seeking uh, collective good is that unless you realize the objective of your mission, unless, say, we get the government to forbid nuclear power generation in Germany, then we don't get anything. We never bring the benefit into being. Well, if you think of it that way, then, yeah, it's the Olson argument seems pretty strong, uh, particularly if you're, if you're looking at people engaged in what would appear to be hopeless uh, kinds of missions. Okay? If you want to uh, say vegetarians or campaign to have the government outlaw the consumption of meat, uh, well, you know, it's, I don't think that's in the cards. And, uh, yet some people uh, put their time and effort and energy and money into what seem to be very hopeless causes. What drives them? What drives them? Well, I think we can understand uh, why they take such actions, uh, actions which turn out to be politically consequential in some cases, some important cases, uh, and we can understand why they act in that way without imputing any irrationality to their action. And without even getting tied up in this question of do they really think they're going <laughs> to determine the success of the campaign by their personal involvement or lack thereof. Uh, and that's where we have to go back to ideology to, to get a grip on uh, this kind of action. Okay? So let's, uh, let's step back now from the collective action problem for a moment and talk about what ideology is. As I said before, it's not just any old idea. It's a belief system a more or less coherent, more or less comprehensive belief system about social relations. So we, we've already ruled out a lot of ideas. Uh, we're not talking about the hard sciences or the life sciences. Or we're not talking about to whether be people believe that uh, the law of gravity applies uh, or, or whether your DNA determines... Uh, something about the kind of being you'll grow up, <clears throat> grow up to be. Uh, we're talking about social relationships, uh, uh, which embraces economics and politics and uh, uh, the usual suspects. Uh, ideology is not the same as a religion, although sometimes they have similarities, and uh, it's easy to see certain people driven by religious beliefs in much the same way that an adherent of an ideology might be driven. Uh, but ideologies don't have to take any position on supreme beings or uh, our, our ultimate place in the universe or what, what's going to happen to us after we die or questions such as that. Uh, and they're, they're not just worldviews. Sometimes people talk about uh, the Weltanschung or... Uh, Worldview, and uh, they're, they're talking about some kind of outlook uh, people have toward uh, what's happening around them. Uh, ideologies are more complex than that, more detailed, uh, more spelled out, and not exactly the same as social philosophy or even political philosophy, uh, because uh, these uh, philosophies uh, don't have all the same elements and consequences that ideology has. It's not just social theory, although it involves social theory. Uh, these belief systems that we properly call ideological have uh, always at least four dimensions, uh, at least as I conceive of them. The first dimension is cognitive, uh, which is to say we use uh, <coughs> ideologies to help us understand or make sense of what's going on in the world around us. Uh, you might say, well, it's obvious what, what people are doing, but if anything, it's far from obvious. 
Uh, we, we are all people who've uh, absorbed uh, uh, many, many years of teaching and interpretation of the world. You know, when we see a particular e- event, if we see, uh, if, if we see uh, someone here at the Mises Institute uh, preparing lunch food for us out here, what could we make of that? You know, this is this is a uh, like a, a bee, a bee that is driven to go get nectar and then uh, deposit the honey in the hive. Are these people who are driven to get food and bring it to the Mises Institute? Uh, that'd be one way to make sense of what's going on here. Uh, a bad way. Uh, but there are any number of ways we could make sense of the simple observation that people are bringing food to the Mises Institute. Uh, we, we might, if we, were, if we were hardcore old-fashioned socialists, we would look at this person perhaps and say, uh, it's a wage slave of Lou Rockwell's. <laughs> this, is a, <clears throat> this is a person who will die uh, if, uh, if she doesn't agree to these onerous terms of employment under which she's, she, she, she's subjected to lose speed up and she has to hurry it to bring food when, when Lou orders her to bring food. Otherwise, she won't get her pittance of pay, which is not even sufficient to maintain life. Uh, and Lou doesn't care because if she dies... The reserve army of the unemployed will provide the next wage slave that will come on board and do exactly the same thing until that worker expires. Okay? <laughs> so <clears throat> that's another way to make sense of what we see going on. Not the best way in my judgment. Or if, if we had the ideology not of old-fashioned socialism but the ideology of, say, classical liberalism, we would say, ah, a person that has agreed to uh, em- employment at the Mises Institute has, has agreed that in exchange for certain definite pay and other benefits, the person will perform uh, reasonable services uh, according to the instructions of supervisors appointed by the employer. Well, that's, that says it, we're looking here at a labor market phenomenon. There's no exploitation. Everybody's acting in a way that is voluntary. Uh, and to me, that's a good way to make sense when I see somebody bringing food to serve for lunch at the Mises Institute. But as you can see, they're depending on the ideological lens you use to view reality, it's possible to impose very different understandings on observations. And all observations of social life have that quality. They're subject to alternative interpretation. So function number one of ideology is cognitive. It tells us what's going on, how to understand what we observe. Function number two Affective means that ideologies don't just tell us what's happening, but they also categorize events as good, bad, or neutral, uh, as virtuous, vicious, or neutral. Uh, I already suggested this with my example. When the Marxian looks at uh, someone bringing lunch, uh, they say not only is this exploitation of, of labor, uh, but this is a bad thing. This shouldn't be happening. We long for the day when the wheel of history turns and we grind the exploiters underneath it and no, no longer will anyone have to endure wage slavery. The appropriator will be appropriated. Uh, on the other hand, I, I, look at, I look at this event and I say, well, that's good. Lou wants to hire somebody to 
provide food service. These people want to sell their services for doing that kind of work. So both parties have been able to come into an agreement uh, that puts them in a better position than they would have been without the agreement, and that's good. We like to see people achieving their ends through voluntary cooperation. That's nice. So and for a classical liberal, uh, the affect is positive of this kind of event. A third element is programmatic. And this is where <coughs> politics comes into <coughs> ideologies. Because they, they all uh, give people a position on what would be politically desirable and undesirable. Uh, if, if, for example, the, uh, the old-fashioned socialist looks at the, uh, the food service worker, uh, he imagines, ah, revolution. Someday, see, we'll overthrow this kind of vile wage slavery. The workers will rise up, uh, whereas if I look at it through the eyes of a classical liberal, I say, I just hope to God that they don't raise the minimum wage uh, <laughs> so that Lou might decide, hell, he'll bring the food himself. Uh, and then they'll all be worse off than they would have been before. So once again, where you stand about political proposals it, it, it derives from your ideological views. So ideologies give rise to political programs. And finally, and this is critical, all ideologies have a solidary dimension. Uh, ideologies, uh, uh, as it were, are the, the membership cards in a community of belief. So that those of us who share a particular ideology uh, are, 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 as it were, comrades. Where we're together on something uh, that we view as important. Because among other things, it concerns politics. It concerns what the government ought to do uh, in the employment of its coercive power or uh, its uh, withholding the exercise of its coercive power. So there's a lot of potential creation and destruction at stake here. Uh, and uh, those of us who have a position on on how those powers ought to be used and uh, their abuses prevented and so forth, know that we're, we're, we're not just, uh, say, members of a garden club, although maybe some members of garden clubs take that very seriously too. Uh, they don't, at least at this point, have to worry too much about, about the government sending the, you know, <coughs> deviants in the garden club to Guantanamo. So... <clears throat> Uh, whereas uh, those of us who are classical liberals in the United States right now have to worry about this because people are being sent to Guantanamo, people who are being sent there notwithstanding uh, the Constitution's guarantee of due process of law to everybody in this country, and not just citizens, by the way, everybody. So uh, solidarity... Uh, is something that the, 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 the Marxists made much of. And uh, if, if you're old enough to remember all those great demonstrations from the 60s and early 70s against the war and uh, for civil rights, you'll remember the, the call that would go out from people in the crowd. They'd say, join us. And that didn't just mean fall in with the crowd. That meant Become one of us. <coughs> Share our beliefs. And furthermore, by acting, <coughs> by acting on your uh, beliefs that we share, you demonstrate that you're the real thing. Okay? That's critical. If you just stand there with your eye, arms folded as the demonstrators go by, uh, marching toward the police who have drawn themselves up down the street. 
getting ready to crack some heads. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, they might think that was okay that you sympathized with them, but it's a very different thing than if you got in there with them and put your head at risk too. They'll never accord you the same esteem and respect standing on the side saying, hey, good luck, <laughs> as they will if you join them and go to the barricades. And by going to the barricades, by doing whatever it is, whether it's street demonstrations, actually giving your money to the cause, you know, putting your time into sending out letters, whatever is part of a movement's collective action enterprise, when you demonstrate to others in the movement that you're making sacrifices to promote that cause, you establish your bona fides as a member of that community. And you get the benefit of, the, of their regard for you. Unless we're psychopaths, we all want the good regard of others we care about. So, so this is not nothing. And in fact, despite what some neoclassical economists might seem to think, kind of dismissing this, oh, well, that's, that's pretty ephemeral. This is probably a lot more important than the movie tickets and trips to the beach that they think are so god-awful fundamental. Okay? That uh, where people think they stand with others who share important beliefs with them is a far more critical thing in their self-esteem <laughs> than whether they can uh, go to the movies again this week or not. So uh, the solidarity element is a very important aspect of uh, ideology because it links uh, utility-maximizing behavior of individuals uh, to uh, their actions uh, in joining in attempts to create Collective goods, even in large groups. So when we see people doing things like not only uh, participating in in, in movements, but voting. There was another one of those unexplained things. Why do people bother to vote? You think your vote's going to sway the election? What a fool. Well, your voting is an act of expression. It's a way that you say to the world, Look, here's the kind of person I am. I'm the kind of guy who votes for George Bush, you know, the defender of the faith, the uh, emperor of the world. Uh, I can stand up and be counted. And, you know, when you go down to Rotary, that's worth something. So uh, that, that, that is one reason you'd vote. I, I, I've often proposed the idea that if you want to find out why people vote, uh, imagine this uh, kind of uh, mental experiment. People can vote if they want to or not, <clears throat> but they can never talk to anybody later about whether they voted or how they voted. Imagine that. Do you think anybody would still vote? I think damn near nobody would. Okay? Because all the benefit of voting comes from the pronouncements you make to other people. I'm going to vote for Joe Blow. I'm that kind of guy. (laughs) Or, I voted, you know, I didn't vote for Al Gore, you know, kind of a creep would vote for Al Gore. And you can be somebody with the people whose opinion uh, matters to you. So... Uh, It's important that you situate people's actions socially uh, in communities of some kind, communities that they care about. And once you start to think about collective action in these terms as expressive and as solidary, then it starts to make perfectly good sense to you. People do all kinds of apparently self-sacrificing things, but there's something in it for them. There's something in it for them. Maybe even people who behave suicidally in a a particular cause for those last few minutes 
feel such a gigantic sense of self-esteem about what they're doing that it makes it worthwhile. Not irrational. Not irrational. It doesn't have to be irrational just because Mansur Olson thought it was irrational. Okay. So, <clears throat> I think uh, this way of uh, uh, thinking about collective action and ideology uh, is very helpful. At least I, I have found it helpful. I find it broadly applicable to, to many different uh, uh, apparently anomalous uh, forms of political participation in the world. And, and if you try it, I think it will work for you too. Now, I want to just give a real quick and dirty kind of a look back because uh, <clears throat> the purpose here is mainly historical, at least for my lectures this week. Uh, and so, so I want to take this uh, notion of ideology that I've just uh, been uh, belaboring and uh, look back at some of the specific forms uh, that uh, ideological commitments have taken uh, in uh, American history and uh, we'll be returning to some of these themes uh, quite a bit in the next four days. Uh, for now, I want to just uh, uh, use a broad brush to, to paint some of the major uh, conjures. The people who settled uh, the British North American colonies brought an ideology with them. <clears throat> and after they got here... <clears throat> and uh, began to uh, reproduce themselves over the generations. They, <clears throat> they developed their ideologies uh, somewhat. Uh, ideologies, by their very nature, tend to change fairly slowly. That is, they, they never just turn on a dime like that, uh, partly because people can't shift mental gears quite that easily. Uh, and partly because they rarely uh, encounter any experience that leads them to, to want to shift mental gears. They, they're able to accommodate things that happen within the limits of their old uh, ideology. Uh, but uh, but uh, ideologies do change, uh, even if slowly. And I think on occasion, uh, they make discrete jumps, uh, at least in periods, short periods of maybe a few years. Uh, so, so that they're noticeable. Uh, the, the Englishmen that came t to North America, and mo most of the people who settled uh, were from the British Isles. Uh, of course, there were, there were Dutch and French and Spanish and a smattering of uh, people from various parts of uh, Europe, but most of them were Englishmen, and that's the culture and the ideology they brought, and uh, it was the germ uh, that they developed thereafter. Um, they, they had conceptions which had, <coughs> had a history of centuries and centuries in the past of something they call the rights of Englishmen. And that, that, that sounds like just kind of a, something I made up, the rights of Englishmen, but that's a term of art. That's, a, that's actually what they called it, <coughs> and, uh, and it meant something pretty definite to them. Uh, it, it meant the, the sorts of uh, due process uh, that we associate to some extent <clears throat> with our Bill of Rights in the Constitution of the United States. Uh, it, it meant that uh, a person who was accused of a crime should have a, a jury trial with a jury of his peers, uh, that he should have the right to, uh, to respond to his accusers and question them, uh, that uh, that uh, the uh, the legal authorities should should not have the power to simply arrest people uh, and imprison them without bringing any charges before an impartial judge, and so on. Uh, so the rights of Englishmen uh, had uh, had developed uh, from far in the in, in the past, and and they were well understood and much valued by the people who came to North America, and. <clears throat> Uh, fortunately for them, I think, uh, even though they were part of the British Empire, uh, they were far away, and, uh, and the British government left them alone to a great extent. So some historians refer to benign neglect uh, 
Britain was an empire. It was an empire that imposed all kinds of mercantilistic rules and laws and procedures. Uh, it granted monopolies to trading companies in various parts of the world. And it gave monopoly franchises to people who sold particular kinds of goods in, in Britain and so on and so on. It was, uh, as uh, some authors would say nowadays, it was a, a rent-seeking society uh, in a big way. Uh, and yet, uh, a lot of these mercantilistic rules that were supposed to apply to the British North American colonies didn't get applied very much. The colonists ignored them, paid tax, didn't pay the taxes they were supposed to pay, smuggled goods in instead of declaring and paying taxes and, and so forth. So, so for uh, well over a century, uh, life developed in British North America, uh, not in isolation exactly from from British rule, but but with a very loose reign, and and they liked it that way. <laughs> <laughs> they liked it that way. There was a lot of money in smuggling, and a lot of Americans uh, did that kind of work. Uh, some of the great founding fathers were were smugglers, and uh, and and that's good. You know, this country was built on smuggling, and and by God, it's uh, still running on smuggling today. Uh, and as a result of the loose rein the British uh, held the colonists with. Uh, they developed de facto self-rule. Now again, I don't want to make this a black and white statement. Uh, they were still subject to, to British rule and in some cases the, uh, the king sent royal governors over to, to be in charge and, and you know, that was just something else you tried to, to work around. <laughs> and, uh, and yet... Despite all the efforts of the imperial government, uh, these people ruled themselves for the most part. Uh, they all developed representative institutions, legislatures in their colonies. Uh, uh, they had the, British con the English common law to use in adjudicating their day-to-day -day disputes, and uh, they certainly were jealous of the rights of Englishmen. And uh, that's how things went for well over 100 years. Uh, the ideas of John Locke were quite popular in the 18th century in North America. Uh, Cato's letters, uh, uh, which had been written back in the 1720s, I guess, uh, circulated widely in the colonies. And the, the, these, if you've never read Cato's letters, uh, uh, by the two English writers, uh, they're wonderful. I mean, they're, some of them are just beautifully libertarian and rousing, and I recommend them highly. And the Americans took to this sort of thing. They, they were feisty, uh, and they liked their independence uh, and self-rule. Uh, later on, you had even wild-eyed people like Thomas Paine, come onto the scene who, who, who was very libertarian, uh, uh, more so than the founding fathers, <laughs> although he joined forces with them to stir up the revolution. So, so you had this kind of atmosphere uh, determining the ideology that was uh, dominant in the colonies by the, uh, by the last quarter of the 18th century. <coughs> And ultimately, of course, it was one of the things that gave rise to the break from England. Because what the colonists were afraid of is after the Seven Years' War ended and the British government decided they, they were going to make the colonists bear some of the financial costs of defending themselves from the French and the Spanish, uh, which the colonists still didn't want to do, uh, they started trying to actually collect. And then they got in involved in disputes with the colonists. And so they tried to take their guns away from them. And one thing led to another, and the hell broke loose finally, and the revolution occurred. Okay? Now, now, after the revolution, 
people were really stirred up ideologically <laughs> because the people who really really believed in Tom Paine type doctrine had had sort of been loosed and encouraged to come out and uh, fight in the militias against the British and 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 a lot of them had done so uh, so so you had some very kind of wild-eyed democrats running around in the woods uh, by 1783 and they were they were get, they were given to, to 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 dancing around the maypole, and you can't have that uh, <laughs> in a respectable society. Uh, so the, the the founding fathers, who were mostly of the better sort, uh, big landowners, big merchants, uh, uh, became quite apprehensive in the 1780s uh, about the security of their property. And, the, and their hold on society uh, out in the frontier areas all the way from, from, from western Massachusetts all the way down, a lot of the people who had moved out there uh, decided they really were ruling themselves. And, and furthermore, they couldn't see a damn thing the United States government was doing for them. So they didn't want to pay any taxes, that was for sure. Uh, and they didn't want to obey any laws or anything else that the new government of the United States imposed on them because they were still being attacked by Indians, and they said, you know, why should we pay and uh, submit to this government? It's not doing anything. It's not protecting us. It's not doing anything. It's just these, these rich guys in Philadelphia are trying to screw us. <laughs> so they got drunk and danced around the maypole. <laughs> uh, that's uh, true Americanism. Now, uh, guys like uh, uh, Washington <coughs> and, uh, and Adams and, and, uh, and even the Virginians, uh, the Jefferson and Madison and the rest of those guys, uh, didn't like the radicalism of this, <laughs> of this situation at all. And it was their apprehension that led them finally to get together and create the Constitution of the United States. Uh, which provided uh, a much stronger central government and gave a definite tax power uh, to that government, uh, which meant that it could get money to pay troops. Okay? This, this is the short lesson in public finance. <laughs> Governments need money to pay soldiers to kill people <coughs> who resist their rule. Okay, that's a short course in political science. Uh, and so that's what the government of the United States was designed to do. And it did some other things along the way. Now, of course, there were many people at the time who, who didn't want this new government, were apprehensive about giving it these powers, uh, and resisted it, and uh, wrote against it, and argued against it, and politicked against it, and what have you. And to some extent, they were able to gain concessions uh, at the Constitutional Convention in, in 1787. But nonetheless, when all the dust had settled, we had a much uh, stronger government. But we were already, at that point, beginning to see the formation of ideological opponents that we can trace down through the next 200 years as direct descendants of the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Now, again, I don't want to overstate this because we, uh, the last 200 years of U.S. history are very complicated and they've involved all sorts of ideas and interest groups and factions. But nonetheless, we can see continuity between these factions, which on the one hand, the faction that supported the U.S. Constitution and, and then became the Federalist political party uh, in, the, in the 1790s, those people favored more centralization, more powerful executive, less self-rule by states and local governments they create, uh, more activism on the part of the central government in going out and undertaking projects, whether it be sponsoring banks or manipulating the money supply or building transportation improvements or uh, building up a navy, uh, whatever it might be, 
that faction tended to be for a more potent, more powerful, more centralized form of government as opposed to their opponents who, who tended to favor decentralization, more home rule by the states and the local governments, uh, laissez-faire, uh, op they opposed the central governments getting involved in these so-called public works, uh, internal improvements, uh, they viewed uh, the government's involvement in those and in banking and just about everything else as a boondoggle, more mercantilism, the kind of thing they tried to throw off when they escaped from the British Empire. And so you, you see then the, the formation of the Jeffersonian Party, the, the Republicans, uh, so-called at that time, uh, as as being uh, in favor of, of, of that set of related policies. And a lot of things can be seen to, to fit under that general description as we go down through the past 200 years. Now, these, these people, uh, as it were, kind of had it out in the 1790s, and uh, uh, the Federalists, with their backs against the wall, uh, decided in 1798 that, uh, that the short way to uh, suppress their opponents was, uh, was shut them up. And if they wouldn't shut up, put them in jail. <clears throat> and if they were foreigners, uh, send them back where they came from. Uh, and so the Alien Sedition Acts were passed. And that was a great motivation to the Jeffersonians to strengthen their opposition. Uh, this to them was outrage that they thought John Adams was trying to make himself a, a, a king or executive in perpetuity. And uh, that, was, that was too horrible to contemplate. And so uh, uh, the uh, states of Kentucky and Virginia passed resolutions basically nullifying the Alien and Sedition Acts. And Jefferson and Madison wrote memorable manifestos uh, in support of those resolutions. Uh, and, uh, and ultimately, uh, Jefferson was elected president in 1800, and, and the Federalists pretty much dissolved as an organized political party for, for the next couple of decades or so. But those interest groups didn't disappear. <laughs> the same people who had supported the Federalists were still out there, and to some extent, they had even embedded themselves uh, in the form of John Marshall uh, getting uh, to become the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, before the Jeffersonians uh, uh, took power. And, uh, and so they still had voice. They had voice in Congress and in the legislatures of the states and in the judiciary particularly. Uh, some political scientists look back and they see uh, the American judiciary is our counterpart of the aristocracies in Europe. And there, 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 there's a grain of truth in, in that perspective uh, because they're more uh, isolated or insulated from uh, politics as they can't be so easily removed from office, for example, if you don't like their decisions. But as time went by, it turned out that, that a new ideological uh, contention arose, uh, or perhaps I should say uh, the embers that had never died completely from old disputes, particularly over slavery, uh, began to burst into flame again. Uh, associated with that was the use of this federal taxing power in the form of the tariff, and both the uh, tariff and the slavery issues, of course, came to divide northern and southern states, uh, even though all the states had had slavery at one time. Uh, it had never been a terribly important institution uh, in the northern states, uh, and it became uh, a vitally important one in the, in the states, particularly of the Deep South. So, so that became a contentious issue because it, it was tied up with control of the federal government in general. If, if new states were created as the great national domain was, was divided into states according to, to the Constitution's rules and the Northwest Ordinances, uh, 
would those be states that permitted slavery or not? Uh, and whether they did would then determine what kind of senator showed up in the Senate of the United States, and that would determine what kinds of laws could make it through Congress and which ones could not. So a great deal was writing on the slavery expansion dispute, uh, including the operation of the tariff system. So th this, this came to dominate uh, American politics and ideological conflict uh, in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, and ultimately, of course, uh, was not resolved, and uh, the war took place. And with the war, we had a, <laughs> a rebirth of statism, uh, because the Lincoln administration, in order to uh, successfully prosecute the war, resorted to all sorts of measures that had not been seen in this country uh, ever, in some cases, and to some extent, if they had ever been used before, went all the way back to the Federalist era at the beginning of the U.S. government. So many of the new taxes levied uh, during the war, for example, were excise taxes and they even uh, laid an income tax, an inheritance tax. Uh, they, they, they laid the diabolical stamp tax that the colonists had resented so, so vastly when the British tried to collect it uh, before the revolution. Uh, so so uh, statism ran amok uh, during the war. And, and, of course, whenever you have a big event like that with so many different dimensions... It leaves many legacies. It changes many people's ways of thinking about why things happen as they do, what is desirable politically, uh, what is expedient politically, what we can get away with, what we can't. Uh, people learned a great deal from uh, the war. And uh, on top of it all, the Republican Party, which had come into existence in the 1850s, became the ruling party of this country uh, for more than a half century afterwards. Uh, the, the only time a Republican wasn't president of the United States, uh, from, from President Lincoln onward uh, to Wilson, was the, was the two separate terms of, of Grover Cleveland. Otherwise, they had a lock on the presidency. Uh, they had their boondoggles, their land grants, their... Uh, their subsidies to business, they, their, their high tariffs, their national banking system, uh, and they had their vast patronage uh, schemes where, where they were in a position to say, who, who was going to be postmaster of Auburn, Alabama? What an insult, uh, among other things. And, uh, <laughs> and they kept this going for a long time. A long time, and that so that was a very important consequence of the statism they had put in place on an even vaster scale during the war. Now, these things again were not undisputed. We still got the heirs of the Jeffersonians out there. Uh, there were there were those two glorious terms of Grover Cleveland. I'm not one to normally rave about politicos. But in the context, you've got to rave about Grover Cleveland. He was a country mile ahead of the uh, others. So we had, we had a curious kind of ideological evolution after the uh, Civil War. And in some ways, uh, these uh, Civil War programs were abandoned or given up. And say the income tax was terminated in 1872. And the inheritance tax was given up. And a lot of the excises, and they quit making... Land grants to railroads after the early 1870s, and so forth. So many, there was a lot of retrenchment. And in some ways, the 1880s looked like a period that approximates laissez-faire about as closely as we, we ever came in this country, maybe comparable to the 1840s or so. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, th that was one movement, and it was already being countered by a movement uh, uh, of people who were promoting new forms of statism. Okay? The, uh, yeah, kind of the, the, the Federalist impulse continued to operate, and it took a number of forms. Uh, one was that Americans began to import from Europe socialism, or 
ideas colored by socialism, which was was a more advanced stage in Europe at that time than in the United States. So, so Americans, particularly after the 1870s, when a lot of young scholars went to Germany to study, because the Germans had venerable old universities that gave the Ph.D. degree. And that was unknown in the United States before 1876 when my alma mater, Johns Hopkins, decided to, to, to pretend to be a venerable old German <laughs> university, even though it was a new kid on the block. And uh, they started giving Ph.D. degrees. And then uh, other universities began to follow. But for a long time, if you wanted to be a, a bona fide uh, academic with a Ph.D., you went to Germany and studied and got a Ph.D. there. And when these guys went there, as, as many people who, who became very influential in, the, in academia in the United States did, uh, they encountered the ideas of German socialism, which were were not only floating around in the universities there, but they were actually being, to some extent, put into practice. So starting in the 1880s, uh, under Bismarck, uh, the Germans started to build what we would now call the welfare state. Pensions, uh, uh, insurance for sick and people injured on the job, and uh, uh, things of that sort, to, 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 to buy off the working class so they wouldn't oppose uh, the government. And... Uh, and it works every time, right? uh, so even in Germany, where you had masses of so- socialists. It was, it was operating as Bismarck intended it to, to operate. And, and, and the real proof of that pudding came in 1914, when you had these legions of German socialists who were supposed to owe allegiance to no nation, but only to the working people of the world. And what did they do? They fell into ranks and marched off to the trenches to be cannon fodder by the millions, some socialists. Right? Never trust a socialist when the chips are down. <laughs> okay, so we were bringing these ideas, these institutions back over here to the United States and representing themselves, th- th- them as advanced thinking. Okay? God, these, these smart guys at Johns Hopkins and Harvard and Columbia, well, they said... We're backward. We didn't even have uh, old age pensions. We didn't even, well, except for all these veterans and their distant relatives, uh, we didn't have uh, insurance when people got sick. The working class uh, had to make do. Uh, that's horrible. So uh, they began to, to write and to speak, to train students, and to produce a cadre of ideological activists for for what we would now look back on and call social democracy, uh, soft socialism. Uh, they didn't all believe in nationalizing all the means of production, although some of them also believed in that. And we eventually had even regular socialist groups, mainline type, old-fashioned socialists who became fairly influential in some places in this country in the late 19th and early 20th century. In cities like Milwaukee, for example, they always had a socialist municipal administration, and uh, and uh, even the state where I was born, Oklahoma, of all places, in the uh, first decade of the 20th century, had the biggest socialist party of any state in America. Go figure. Right? Uh, they were they were actually <laughs> they, they were what we were more inclined here to call populists. But somehow the Socialist Party there went out and organized these farmers and because uh, they always thought they were being cheated by bankers and railroads. And so, uh, well, let's nationalize the banks and the railroads. Well, take care of that. So socialism itself got to be fairly uh, influential. But, uh, but more importantly was the, the way that socialist ideas began to penetrate society. Uh, when we talk about the importance of ideology, as I've said before, it's often uh, an importance that is felt slowly. It takes decades sometimes for people to absorb the outlooks and the beliefs and the commitments of, of an ideology. Uh, and these guys 
who came back from Germany were the pioneers, I think, of, of producing what has come to be the dominant ideology of the United States in the, in the 20th century. Now, in the early 20th century, we had uh, uh, a progressivism, which was to some extent an expression of these trends I've been discussing. Uh, it had some homegrown elements, too. Uh, as always, we see some conflicting currents, uh, some counter movements going on. Uh, progressivism, uh, in, in the eyes of some analysts, people like Gabriel Kolko, for example, uh, it looks like a, a conspiracy of big business interests to capture the power of the state to solidify their cartels. Okay? And we can certainly find some evidence that that, that sort of thing was, was going on uh, during the progressive era. Quite, quite a lot of such evidence, in fact. Uh, but at the same time, many progressives hated b big business and the trusts wanted to break them up subject them to government control, or at one point uh, they even espoused a, a, a license, a federal license, that w every corporation doing business in interstate commerce would have to get from the federal government to do business. And then, of course, the issuer of that license would be able to establish the terms on which those companies could operate. So that would have been a a lever of control over, over anybody doing an interstate business, I mean, all the big businesses. Okay. Well, so there were, there were any business and pro-business elements of progressivism. Uh, there were also uh, any politics uh, groups, strange to say. What are you doing in politics if you're against politics? Well, they were against corrupt uh, existing type politics, the kind that we saw in all the big cities in America, where we had bosses. Uh, the, all these immigrants were coming here by the millions in the late 19th century, and because they didn't have any established position in society, nobody gave a damn about them, and uh, they, they were kicked around right and left by the ruling class. So pretty soon, somebody, political entrepreneurs, see that there's hay to be made. Let's organize these guys. They, they can vote. <laughs> we'll organize all these immigrant voters and we'll, we'll pay them off with a turkey on Thanksgiving. Uh, or, you know, we'll go down to the police court when they get arrested. And, and since you know, they speak only Polish, we'll send somebody down there to help them explain to the judge that they didn't mean it. Uh, and, and we'll do something for these guys and they'll be beholden to us and they'll vote for our guys at the election. And, and they did. <laughs> this system really worked pretty well. So this is another way in which the welfare system came to America through politics. The people have always received assistance when they were destitute. They got it from friends, family, churches, lodges, all sorts of voluntary associations. But now we're using politics. We're using political power because uh, Cleveland is getting the money by taxing people. And then these aldermen are turning around and using the money to hire Joe Palooka uh, to stand around on a public construction job and collect his pay. So, so this system uh, was something that the progressives detested. Uh, they, they really began in the form of the goo-goos. Uh, goo-goo was a term of ridicule that uh, was used for people that wanted good government. Goo-goo. <laughs> and uh, realists looked at these the guys in the 17, I mean, excuse me, 1870s, 1880s who wanted good government and the suppression of corruption. They said, "What a bunch of naive fools! You know, don't they understand politics? Uh, they want to get rid of corruption. It's part and parcel of politics." Uh, so, but eventually, these gugus, uh, who were kind of point men for the respectable class, uh, began to get political power of their own uh, or to expand on positions of power they had enjoyed already. And so, so the, uh, when the progressives got truly in flower after about 1900 or so, a lot of the gugu people now became progressives, and they, they wanted to get rid of old-fashioned style politics, particularly in the states and the cities, and substitute what? Not politics. That's inherently corrupt. 
They weren't so dumb as to substitute politics. They wanted to substitute uh, decision-making by disinterested experts. Why, who could argue with that? Don't you want the experts to decide things? You want a bunch of amateurs? Uh, and, 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 and you certainly can expect, say, a, a guy who's been to Columbia to be disinterested. And so... <laughs> Uh, you, you, you basically appoint all your respectable pals to administrative positions, whether it's city manager of a, uh, of a town or, or whether it's a member of a regulatory commission uh, to, to set utility rates or tell the railroads how much they can charge for hauling different classes of freight. And, and, and the experts run things. And they run more and more things because... If expert administration is good, then more expert administration is better. So the progressives begin to look around and see that there's hardly anything going on in, in economic life that can't be improved with regulation by disinterested experts. Because yeah, they're not political. Well, uh, it's hard to say whether they really believe this malarkey. Uh, I think some of them did actually. Uh, it was extremely naive, uh, and hard-nosed people never believed it for a minute, uh, and, and some of them just used it, particularly the business interests who, who looked around and said, okay, we've got these, these idiot progressives running amok, uh, and as Samuel Insel said quite explicitly on one occasion, better for businessmen to get involved than to wait and have that involvement thrust upon him. So when they got involved, they made a difference because what they had was a lot of money. And money is a fine thing in politics. I don't care what country you're talking about or what the system is. Money does wonders. So a lot of business interests organized uh, and became involved in progressive politics. And that's where we get all of these developments that Gabriel Kolko and and Wiebe and other historians have uh, documented at great length, uh, which involved the uh, solidification of business cartels in a number of industries. Well, uh, I'm going to stop there just uh, with the summary statement that by the time we get to progressivism, we've crossed over. We've crossed over from an old regime to the one that has, uh, although flowered and developed in a multitude of ways in the past hundred years. It's basically progressivism. That's what we've endured in this country ever since. The whole idea that government should be involved in this and that and that and that, that we should have regulatory commissions here, there, and everywhere, uh, that, that government can improve on the state of affairs in the unhampered market that government officials know what to do to promote the public interest and we can expect that they will do it. The two great fallacies of the mixed economy uh, all wrapped up in progressivism uh, and that, that, that has been the germ, uh, ideological germ uh, of uh, any number of pernicious developments in American politics for the past hundred years. Brad? Could you talk a little bit about the uh, sort of takeover of the Democratic Party in 1996 and how it played into this? Uh, well, uh, the most important thing was probably that it destroyed the old Democratic Party. Uh, the, Cleveland Party. the Cleveland Party, the Gold Democrats, the, the people who believed in, in solid private property rights and low tariffs and, and uh, home rule by the state and local governments, and, and, and all those very Jeffersonian-type things. Uh, Cleveland was the last uh, national Democratic leader who espoused that kind of program. And uh, after you had the William Jennings Bryan debacle, uh, the, uh, the, the new-type Democrats who, who merged with, with the populists and, uh, and progressives... Uh, uh, it became quite different. Now, now, Woodrow Wilson in some ways looks like an old-fashioned Democrat, at least for a while. <laughs> that doesn't last long. <clears throat> and, and then, and then 
with World War One, well, that's the end of it. I mean, there, there's no doubt after that that the Democrats are uh, are the party of statism, whereas before the Republicans were the party of statism, and now both the major parties are the parties of statism, and that's where we've been ever since. That they just serve slightly different masters, and even then, not all that different, uh, because uh, the people with uh, substantial political resources get served no matter which party is in power. It's a, it's a fraud that uh, there's a competitive political system. It's, you know, even uh, Engels wrote that what the United States has is the rotation of two bands of pirates who, you know, who pre pretend to compete, but they're both engaged in plundering the public. Questions, comments, Guido? Yeah, one comment. I mean, it's symptomatic that uh, until uh, fairly recently there was a word lacking to, to describe the phenomenon, right? Because we're always talking about collectivism, socialism, fascism, and so on. Uh, all expressions that uh, focused away attention from the main phenomenon, the, the core, which was statism. And statism, I remember Mises when he wrote bureaucracy, right? It was a footnote or something, well, for lack of a better term, we could say statolatry or right, statism. So there was obviously a word still making uh, to describe this. Well, uh, that's one of the, uh, <clears throat> I think, imp important a aspects of progressivism that, that I, I kind of stumbled upon myself when I was uh, uh, writing my book, Crisis and Leviathan. Uh, the, the chapter on progressivism was a kind of afterthought. It probably shows uh, originally I hadn't planned to write a chapter on progressivism, but it became increasingly obvious to me as I worked on the book that, uh, that I needed to give some account uh, of how the dominant ideology of the United States changed because it was that change uh, that made the consequences of crisis different in the 20th century than they had been in the 19th century. Uh, so I... I tried to learn as much as I could about progressivism. And, and one of the first things I discovered is that, well, it doesn't look as if it's coherent at all. It has all these different uh, uh, types of uh, elements. You know, it's anti-political, it's pro-political, it's pro-business, it's anti-business, it's, uh, it's, it's this, that, and the other. It looked as if it was, it was for and against everything simultaneously, and that didn't make any sense. How could it be some kind of a consequential movement? But I ultimately began to see that, that every one of these progressive positions had one thing in common, and that is they proposed to use the power of government to accomplish something that they could not accomplish otherwise. So essentially progressivism was statism. Uh, statism for many different purposes, uh, uh, promoted by many different interest groups and individuals, uh, but statism through and through. Brad? Um, just, it seems like today, if there is anything maybe a little bit brighter than it was then, is that now people tend to be sort of cynical when they hear about government's ability to accomplish something. In fact, it seems like what you read from that time, with the exception of a few really bright <coughs> satirists, people just have this great faith that government's the great... Uh, so, so, sometimes I share that impression you have that, that I look back and I say these people were so naive uh, and I don't even have to go back that far you know, I, I, I go back to the 1940s and I look at what the government used to tell people and I think people believe this? I mean, this is, I mean it's, it's so blatant uh, malarkey uh, and I know some of them did uh, but then I look around me today and I decide that people are just as naive, just as easily fooled by the government now as they were a hundred years ago. Uh, they, they believe what they're told. They do what they're told. And indeed, I, I think I am prepared to conclude that uh, they're even more docile now than, than they were a hundred years ago because there was still an element in a few people a hundred years ago of American independence of people who would stand up and say, well, that's crazy. Ralph? Well, just a short question. Brother Cleveland seems to have been the uh, last president we could have any respect for. Uh, where did he come from? 
<laughs> set up question by Ralph Rako. <laughs> he came from Buffalo, of course. Okay, and a short follow up question. Where uh -huh. was William McKinley shot? <laughs> <laughs> Coincidence or conspiracy? <laughs> Joe? Yeah. Right. Uh, in your, your journal, which you edit, yeah. Independent Review, there was a review a couple of years ago, and it escapes me the name of the author, but it was a book arguing that at the state level, the organized farm interests really pioneered a lot of the progressive bureaucracy by setting up you know, state agriculture departments. I mean, Alabama, I guess, was mm -hmm. the biggest fiefdom until education overtook it. Now, this is the biggest fiefdom. <laughs> Do uh, you have any comment on the organized farmers? Well, the, the farmers' uh, attempts at organization go way back, and of course they got a commissioner of agriculture at the federal level uh, during the war between the states. Uh, so that was the beginning of the federal involvement, and also the land grant, uh, the Merrill Act, uh, to establish these so-called land grant colleges. Uh, <laughs> If you seek its monument, look look across the street. <laughs> There's one right there. Uh, Auburn is the land grant uh, institution of the state of Alabama, and every state has one. What uh, year was that? Did you say uh, it was uh, 1862. Yeah, two early in the war. Obviously, this was an idea whose time had come rather suddenly, uh, and. Uh, and this, this, this was a very early example of this way that the federal government gets the states roped into doing what somebody wants the federal government to do and makes it look a little more constitutionally legitimate, at least in the beginning. Uh, after a while, they don't worry about that at all anymore. But, uh, uh, but the, farmer, the farmers uh, also had these state departments of agriculture in, in every state. And, and for the most part in the 19th century, uh, these government uh, interventions in agriculture were, were engaged in research and dissemination of, uh, of information and uh, passing out seeds. And, and, and they were really pretty trivial. Uh, not too many of them uh, ever did anything of importance, but... Uh, but occasionally one of them would, and, and, and dissertations have actually been written by economic historians to prove that the investment in uh, government agricultural research had had gigantic rate of return uh, just because of uh, two or three uh, innovations that came out of these uh, experiment stations. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they devised, uh, I think, in... Uh, in Wisconsin, if my memory serves me, a, a machine for measuring the milk fat content of milk. And, well, that turned out to be a pretty important instrument in agriculture. And, and so just, just the, the payoff on that one innovation pretty much covered the whole <laughs> federal expense of, uh, of agricultural experiment stations for 50 years. Uh, uh, it wasn't until World War I that this began to take a nasty turn uh, toward regulation. Uh, and, of course, the government regulated heavily uh, under the Lever Act in World War I, uh, prices of uh, wheat and uh, uh, the prices of a number of agricultural uh, and raw commodities uh, and, and other conditions. Uh, used this licensing power I mentioned that they had threatened on all corporations. It was... Uh, exercise under the Lever Act, and if, if you didn't do the government's bidding, they withdrew your license, and you were out of, out of business. So, so uh, in order to get all the local farmers uh, regimented for World War I, they, they sent agents around, and they, uh, they basically invented what's now known as the Farm Bureau. Uh, and uh, afterwards, it was, uh, it was carried forward and, and came to look like a private organization, but it, it was entirely the the creation of government agents during the war. And, uh, and from that time on, of course, having all these uh, well-organized uh, state, state groups, the farmers became a more potent lobbying uh, interest group, and they managed to get several acts of Congress uh, 
to give them uh, a financing uh, uh, during uh, the 1920s, and then uh, uh, the Agricultural Marketing Board was created in 1929 uh, to prop up farm prices, and, and then the dam burst totally in 1933 with the Agricultural Adjustment Act, and, and we've, had, we've had that ever since in its, in its many forms. Uh, the, the most beautiful of all these these agricultural uh, interventions, to my way of thinking, was the was the great hoax of '96, that being 1996, when uh, Congress decided to give vast tanker loads of cash to farmers in order to phase out subsidies, and this was called the Freedom to Farm Act. Because now they didn't have to obey any rules about acreage restrictions or anything. They were free to make good, solid, sound economic decisions about what to plant and how much and so forth. Now, of course, this was a big shock to them, so they had to be given huge amounts of money to make the transition. And they were given those huge amounts, plus, I believe, of the, of the next seven years, at least six of them, they got additional emergency bailout money uh, because uh, rain didn't fall somewhere in Nebraska. And, uh, and so they raked in all this loot uh, in the service of phasing out a federal intervention in the details of farm decision making. Uh, and when that law expired, of course, all those uh, interventions were reinstituted along with huge tanker loads of cash to, to, uh, <laughs> to accommodate them to the shock of going back to the old system. <laughs> okay.